Civil Discourse is on the line this midterms. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. This is another Declaration of Truth from your host, Terry A. Hurlbut. That's right. This midterms will decide more than whether the American Republic will come back. It will likely decide whether civil discourse will play uh, will stay current in the United States. One side favors it, the other side deprecates and has already abandoned it. We see this not only in social media, but also on the campaign trail. We're going to talk about that and what this means for a great sortation of the American people into two geographically distinct regions. Before we dive deeper into it, I do want to shout out to the prime sponsor of this channel, which is Conservative News and Views. Link in the description. Be sure to check out the awesome CNAV store. Scroll down near the bottom for that link. Lots of great merchandise there, including this t-shirt that I have chosen for today, which depicts Plato, one of the greatest of the Greek philosophers, and quotes him as saying, No one is more hated than he who speaks the truth. I am going to tell you a truth today, and some of you are going to feel uncomfortable about it, but somebody has to say it, and I might as well be that somebody. On Monday, August the 22nd, one day before primary day in New York, Florida, and Oklahoma, acting Governor Kathy Hochul of New York fired the first salvo. New York's 19th Congressional District was holding a special election after Representative Antonio Delgado, also of New York, resigned to become Lieutenant Governor. Democrat Paul Ryan and Republican Andrew Molinaro were facing off in that election. So, at a campaign rally for Ryan, Kathy Hochul said this, My friends, we are fighting for democracy. We're fighting to bring government back into the people and out of the hands of dictators. And we're here to say that the era of Trump and, uh, that's Representative Lee Zeldin, her campaign opponent, and Molinaro, stop right there. Now at this point, you thought I was going to tell you that she continued that sentence with the words is and over, didn't you? Well, it didn't work out that way. Instead, in the middle of that sentence, she broke off and went on a rant. I have links in the description to two resources where you can play the video of her remarks. One on Twitter, the other on Rumble. Now listen. Now, after she says Molinaro's name, she says, Just jump onto a bus and head down to Florida where you belong, okay? Get out of town. Get out of town because you don't represent our values. You are not New Yorkers. You are not New Yorkers. Because we come from a long line of people who fought for women's rights that happened here first. And environmental justice and labor rights and the rights of those who choose alternative lifestyles. Now, those four things are typical Democratic Party talking points. And you expect her to mention those. But you don't expect her to abruptly break off in the middle, break off one sentence and start another. It's that such a rant. A lot of influencers thought and still think that she was saying something like this. All you who would vote for Trump or Zeldin or Molinaro, just jump onto a bus and head down to Florida where you belong. Or maybe just jump into a lake like Lawrence Harvey as Raymond Shaw in the 1962 version of The Manchurian Candidate. Huh? So, <coughs> did acting Governor Hochul speak uh, clumsily and make her speech sound harsher than she meant? Yes, I think she did. But why? Maybe in the middle of her sentence, she decided to express her true feelings. And those true feelings are that she feels nothing in common with anyone who votes or would vote against her. And even if she did not intend to tell millions of voters and their families to leave New York, she did say that her opposing candidates are not New Yorkers. Well, if they're not New Yorkers, then they who would vote for them are not New Yorkers either. 
Well, for his part, Representative Zeldin said, I'm not going anywhere. And he said more, and I have a link in the description to his tweet where you can read the rest of it. Uh, nothing off color, it's just that I don't have time. Uh, time, got to go on. Separately, a reporter named John Campbell decided to juxtapose her remarks with remarks that then-Governor Andrew Cuomo made a year ago. He said, and I quote, Who are they? Are these the extreme conservatives who are right to life, pro-assault weapon, and anti-alternative lifestyle? Is that who they are? Because if that's who they are, and if they are the extreme conservatives, they have no place in the state of New York, because that is not who New Yorkers are, unquote Andrew Cuomo. I have a link in the description to John Campbell's tweet. Very clever fellow. He took two graphics, each of them is the image of the text of one of the two, one of their speeches, one for Hochul, the other for Cuomo. And he put them side by side in his tweet so you can read each one. Ladies and gentlemen, these are not examples of civil discourse. Part of civil discourse is open and polite debate about different political ideas and candidates for public office. Alexis de Tocqueville talked about that in his Democracy in America. When you order people out of your jurisdiction for running and maybe for voting against you, you are breaking not only civil discourse, but the very value that you say that you most support, which is democratic elections. Now, these are also some of the bitterest substitutes for civil discourse I have seen in, from political candidates. They're also counterintuitive. I mean, at least in California, leftist political leaders recognize that when people flee their state, they take their tax dollars with them. So they've put up billboards in Los Angeles and San Francisco begging people not to leave, <coughs> or at least not to move to Texas. And they cite the Uvalde incident as a reason to stay. But in New York, you have one governor who openly told patriotic Americans to leave his state, and then his successor, just that last week, probably let slip her wish that such people would leave and definitely told opposing candidates to leave. Paul Ryan won that special election, which won't change anything because he's replacing another Democrat. Now, did he win because too many Republican voters took Andrew Cuomo's advice when he gave it? Well, we might never know, but in Florida, Former Governor Charlie Crist, who is now a Democrat, said something almost as bad after he won his primary. The, I mean, Ron DeSantis didn't have one. I'll get back to that. He actually <laughs> defined <coughs> a class of voters whose votes he would not seek. Yeah, this is what he said. Those who support the governor should stay with him and vote for him, and I don't want your vote. If you have that hate in your heart, keep it there, unquote Charlie Quist. Hey, Chris, now, no politician ever says or implies that some people shouldn't vote for him, or no one did before today. Again, part of civil discourse is persuading other people to exchange your point of view for that of your opponent. It is no part of civil discourse to write people off as Charlie Quist did. And apparently, as President Biden did, when he actually called those who support President Trump semi-fascists. So who are the real extremists, as one other influencer asks. And I have another link in the description to their tweet, uh, to her tweet, in which this influencer asked that very thing. Before we talk about this further, I want to shout out to a sponsor who can really help you through the economic storms to come. The sponsor is OurSilverLines.com. Do you feel like you're working harder for your money just to get by? You are not alone. The fluctuating economy, employment issues, and unexpected changes in life have left many families struggling over the past few years. Collecting gold and silver can help shield you against many of these challenges. But if you're like me many years ago, you don't know where or how to start. Our Silver Lines helps by connecting you with thousands of members who are, are learning the secrets to creating and protecting true wealth by collecting precious metals. Now, whether you just want to collect rare and unique coins or take advantage of the business opportunities 
that company provides, they can help you learn to live an exceptional life. Visit OurSilverLife.com to learn how you can build a legacy for your future. Now, when elected officials like Acting Governor Hochul or candidates like former Governor Christ say things like what they said, they're admitting that this upcoming midterms will be a contest for the heart and soul of this country. But they're also behaving like immature children who definitely did not get a good education in civil discourse. Adults do not tell one another as the 1894 song runs, I don't want to play in your yard. I don't like you anymore. In fact, I'm going to leave a link in the description to an excellent video on YouTube of somebody singing that song, and I hope you'll play it and really think about how, that, how sad that attitude can be, which is the whole point of that song. Now, the problem is, this is what we're seeing from Democrats today. In fact, we're hearing it uh, hearing this from more than governors and those running against them. Jenna Griswold, the Secretary of State in Colorado, actually said that midterms will decide whether we have democracy in America anymore. Never mind that democracy is two wolves and a lamb voting on what's for dinner. Republicans are actively running Secretary of State candidates for the first time. Moreover, Several county election officials have complained that Jenna Griswold runs her office in a partisan manner. And now, going into midterms and facing re-election herself, she's talking about trying to save democracy. Now, listen to this. What we can expect from the extreme Republicans running across this country <coughs> is to undermine free and fair elections for the American people, strip Americans of their right to vote, refuse to address security breaches, and unfortunately be more beholden to Mar-a-Lago than the American people." Unquote Jenna Griswold. She speaks of Republican Secretary of State candidates, if elected, weaponizing their posts. Now when she does that, she's following Saul Alinsky's rule. Always accuse your opponent of doing what you do. Now, this last part also reveals a pattern of Republicans finally, in a long overdue change, paying attention to sleepy races. Until recently, no one thought a state secretary of state had duties of a policy-making character. They pushed paper, counted the votes, and that was it. And as long as they did their job, nobody paid them a bit of attention. Bad move. Enter George Soros who started his Secretary of State project to put in place Secretaries of State who would loosen the security requirements for elections. Voting by mail and unattended drop boxes are part of that. And because mail-in ballots skew left, suddenly the Secretary of State does have duties of a confidential, policy-determining, policy-making, and policy-advocating character. Republicans have now gotten wise to this, and now Democrats know that they're wise, and it scares them. School elections have also come out of the sleepy race category. Teachers' unions discovered a while back that they can best affect school policies by campaigning for sympathetic boards of Board of Education candidates. They also sought more policy changes than teacher salary raises. The National Education Association openly pushes the eight precepts of woke and the advocacy of other left-wing policies in class. And those same unions planned last year to support their favorite Board of Education members with dark money if they had to. But this year, Governor Ron DeSantis of Florida pushed back. He knew that sympathetic boards of education can stop woke and grooming better than can state officials or even courts. After all, when you've got a problem, you try to nail it at the source, right? Right. So, he recruited and campaigned actively for 30 conservatives to run for their local school boards. I have a link in the description to his tweet giving all 30 of his school board endorsements. Well, 21 of his candidates won outright, 
and four more are headed into runoffs that will coincide with midterms. Leaders of the 1776 Project PAC, who provided the detailed leadership on this, plan to repeat that campaign in other states. These are the best reforms that we've seen, and the school elections are more important still. <laughs> I mean, secretaries of state do count the votes, and as Joseph Stalin said, that's what matters in any election. Boards of education are responsible for how the next generation will vote and conduct civil discourse. So what do we see? We see Republicans welcoming people into their states and Democrats pushing people out of theirs. Their policies were bad enough. Now we hear them at best saying, pay our exorbitant taxes or leave, or else they are ordering people to leave if they don't want to vote for them, uh, them. and people are leaving. A great sortation has, begun, has been taking place since late last year, especially since leftists have been abandoning civil discourse into the states they control. U-Haul still charges three times as much to move out of California as to move in. Recall also that in March, the Los Angeles Times scornfully bad conservatives good riddance. If that continues, and unless civil discourse improves, political contests are only going to get more bitter. In the best case, that state of affairs won't last because leftist policies are not sustainable. Not only do they not work economically, but they discourage the very making of a next generation. So demographic winter might eventually flip those states, as Stephen Turley, Ph.D., sometimes predicts. The worst case involves secession. An Article 5 Convention of States could report out an Aslan Charter, to include all the blue states and most of Canada. You know, we expect Alberta and Saskatchewan to join the old United States. Now, will New Aslan control it, content itself with expelling non-woke people from its territory? Actually, they might have to. Because makers of the arms that the Constitution recognizes the right of the people to keep and bear might move out of that polity and into the old United States, as two of them already have. Remington Arms moved to Georgia and Smith & Wesson to Texas. Now, what are the woke country leaders going to say then? We're going to huff and puff and blow your house down? They might be just that childish and just about ineffective, which means ineffective. And they will continue policies that will eventually make their territory ungovernable. The history of the United States as presently constituted doesn't have to end this way. A return to civil discourse can save it, but the Kathy Hochul's and the Charlie Chris and the Jenna Griswolds aren't helping. Link in the description of the article to have Kathy Hochul telling her opponents to get out of New York, to Lee Zeldin giving it right back to her, to John Campbell comparing her words to Andrew Cuomo's words, to the person who asks who are the real extremists, to I don't want to play in your yard, to Ron DeSantis' list of 30 Board of Education endorsements, and the Conservative News and Views. I've also left links to the awesome CNAD store and to OurSilverLines.com, as I also mentioned. And if you like what you've heard, you can like this video and click on the bell icon to get notices whenever I come up with another video. On the end screen, I'm going to leave a subscribe link and definitely a link to I Don't Want to Play in Your Yard, and one or two other videos that on that are related to this subject. This is Terry A. Harbour delivering another declaration of truth and reminding you to let the truth set you free.